whole idea that Bitcoin versus not Bitcoin, we're going to have more storms or less storms. It's totally ridiculous. We're much closer to the coldest time in the last 600 million years than the warmest time right now. We are in an ice age because we have ice at the poles. So officially we're in an ice age right now. You can tax people in many different ways. You can have a CBDC. Then you can control how much meat everybody gets to eat. You've had too much meat this month. You can't buy anymore. You've flown too much this year. You can't fly anymore. The whole idea that uh, if you emit more CO2, we're going to have more storms or more floods or droughts or fires. There's nothing in the data at all to support any of that. Truth is going to win out and it is winning out now, but it, it's an amazing time of hysteria. We don't have CO2 in the air. We all die. We have to have it there. So the fight against CO2 is like fighting oxygen or it's like fighting water. It's just a critical part of our life. I do think that the whole money printing thing is affecting everything, including the forever wars and the forever war against carbon dioxide. There's this idea you can just point at bad weather and say, ah, this proves that CO2 causes bad weather. But it's never true. This whole printing of money is just such an evil thing for humanity. So much misallocated capital. It just uh, kind of makes me sick. This whole idea of free money that governments can't use for forever wars again, it makes me really happy. I have, uh, I have high hopes for it and I'm a fan and I, I'm orange pilled. Today we have really an interesting and very focused topic. Uh, I think climate uh, and especially with Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining, I think those are like really interesting uh, fuels that we can get into. But before we get into climate and Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining and all those things, I have one question that I'm asking myself a lot. Uh, and this is a common theme around my podcast where I ask my guests a lot what sound money has and has an impact on society. And I was wondering if sound money has an impact on climate and on our weather and on our current situation in, 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 on earth, like on, on the climate, if this has any impact on climate or, or doesn't, or does the earth, uh, don't care about, uh, what money we use as human beings? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. And the earth does not care what type of money we use. I say that uh, no matter what we do, if we spend $50 trillion on the climate thing and I'll go live in caves, it's not going to make any measurable effect on weather or climate ever. So the whole idea that Bitcoin versus not Bitcoin is we're going to have more storms or less storms. It's totally ridiculous. It's not happening. Yeah, I, I thought so, but I just want to get this out of the way because I think a lot of people argue argue that even in Bitcoin, I think people are like, oh, this fixes that and fixes that. It's not like really cool. Um, one other topic with Bitcoin and climate, um, a lot of people say like, oh, Bitcoin mining it consumes so much energy. It's bad for the climate. It's bad for the environment. This this is a common thought that we we always get. Um, is there anything to it from from your perspective? Uh, no, from my perspective, there's nothing to it. Again, the, the whole idea that uh, if you emit more CO2, we're going to have more storms or more floods or droughts or fires. There's nothing in the data at all to support any of that. So it, it's all uh, fear. It's all FUD. It's not true at all. Interesting. Yeah. Perfect. Then let's get into the, the real question. Um, you sent me a picture, really interesting one, where you listed, I think, five or six myths uh, that, that are commonly known around the climate. Uh, and, uh, I just wanted to get that out of the way and get like those uh, into the discussion. And the first one <laughs> is a really interesting one. The earth is too hot. Is that something that, that you get a lot? At, at least I hear it a lot. Is, is that, uh, why is that not true? Yeah, I mean, we're supposed to believe right now that the Earth is too hot, but we're told that the uh, global average temperature is maybe 59 degrees Fahrenheit or something. Uh, the whole idea that uh, the warming since 1850 has uh, caused the Earth to get too hot, there's just nothing uh, th that supports that. And even right now, we're told that uh, cold kills maybe 10 times as many people as heat in the Earth. So the whole idea that we want the earth to be colder, if we care about humans, we should want the earth to be warmer. And uh, warm times have always been better for uh, humans and for life on earth than cold times. So there's nothing wrong with the, t the earth's temperature right now. And the whole idea that we want to go back to 1850 when it was colder, we don't. We had uh, shorter growing seasons and it wasn't as good a time to be on earth when, it, when it's cold as when it's warm. Is it getting hotter? Is, like, is, is, it, or is it getting hotter on, on earth? 
Yeah, that's a great question, and uh, depends on your starting point. So it is warmer now than it was in 1850, and it's warmer now than it was in 1975. So you could say it's warming if you use those starting points. But there's a lot of other starting points in our past that were much warmer than it is now. It was warmer 4,000 years ago, and you can tell that by looking at the uh, tree lines. The tree lines were further north in the Arctic uh, 4,000 years ago than now. And of course, there are a lot of humans were alive 4,000 years ago, and it was warmer then, and, and there was nothing wrong with that. And uh, over the last 600 million years, it's been much warmer than now for most of that time. We're much closer to the, the coldest time in the last 600 million years than the warmest time right now. And we are in an ice age because we have ice at the poles. So officially, we're in an ice age right now. So. Th yeah, the whole idea that it's too hot right now. We're a tropical species. Uh, humans like to live where it's warm. We like to vacation and uh, retire where it's warm. So the whole idea that, oh, no, the earth is too hot right now, not supported by any evidence. Oh, that's that's that that's crazy that that we are living in an ice age. I never, I think, I never <laughs> heard that one. It's, it's interesting. Um, is it is other cycles? normal and can can we even do something against those cycles like even if we really if the whole world and all humans are like let's get it colder warmer could we even um influence those getting warmer and getting colder cycles yeah another great question and the earth's uh, climate is so complicated that there's just tons of cycles that are superimposed on each other there's really long-term cycles and short-term ones and I've had some people on my podcast talking about this, that it looks like there's these uh, cycles of various lengths. And sometimes they all line up so it gets really warm. And sometimes they line up so it gets cold. But it's they're not perfect cycles. And we can't predict in advance exactly, exactly what's going to happen. Uh, so humans can affect their local weather and climate by stuff that we do, like right around a city. Uh, locally, you can affect it. But the whole idea that we can do stuff and we're going to cool the entire planet or warm the entire planet, we can try that. But uh, we can try it with geoengineering, et cetera. But still, all these other really complicated things are still happening no matter what we do. It's the whole idea that we just can uh, consider ourselves as turning a thermostat and just adjusting the temperature of the whole planet. That's uh, kind of a dream, but it's uh, not something that uh, we should even try to do, I think. Is that uh, the human brain uh, thinking it's 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 too big? <laughs> I, guess, I feel like sometimes the human body and the uh, and the puny psychology is like, oh, like we are so important and we can do a lot of the world, and but yeah, we are just like really small items in the bigger universe, and there are bigger forces than us. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's some modern thinking that you can just change the thermostat in the room you're in and it, uh, the temperature is, can be adjusted to what you want. So people think, why can't we just do that outside of our house too? But you can't. You can't. But, why, but, but why do you think uh, we are hearing those, uh, oh, we're in a climate crisis, we have to stop driving with the car because otherwise it gets too hot, we have to cool down the climate, like all, all, all those those narratives are really, really, really represent, like really big in, in mainstream me media and if you go out in the streets. Yeah, so the late Charlie Munger called it a Lollapalooza effect, that there's all these different incentives that are uh, pushing people in one direction. So like the media, for example, uh, it's really exciting if they can say that the earth is too hot and whatever just happened is unprecedented. It's, it's super exciting and uh, it, it might uh, get you more clicks or sell more papers or whatever. So that's one thing. And then if you're a climate scientist or just a scientist in general, and right now, if you want funding for like butterfly research, people use that as an example. You might not get funding if you just want to research butterflies. But if you say, I want to research the effect of climate on butterflies, then you're much like more likely to get funding if you just put climate in there, you put some climate speak in there, as uh, Steve Coonan says. So there's that. And then I think a lot of people are just motivated because they want to feel important. I think it's a human uh, trait that we want to feel important. And uh, it really uh, makes people feel uh, they feel excited about their work if they think they're saving human civilization. So I think. Quite a few climate scientists alive right now are motivated by uh, this view of themselves that they're saving human civilization. What they're doing is so important. And uh, what they do is so important only if there's a climate crisis. If the weather is just kind of fluctuating all over and there's no crisis whatsoever, then uh, they're not so important anymore. I think that's a big factor in all of this. It's, and then there's so much power and money on the line for governments. Uh, you can tax people in many different ways. You can have a CBDC central bank digital currency and you can uh, 
if you think there's a climate crisis or if you can sell that idea, then you can uh, control how much meat everybody gets to eat on an individual level. You've had too much meat this month. You can't buy anymore. You've flown too much this year. You can't fly anymore. So there's all this uh, control and taxation and power. It's amazing that so many things are pushing in the same direction. And I think that's why the human entity has gone off the rails here, getting so excited, so hysterical over nothing. And the whole idea that CO2 is a pollutant and there's any sort of a crisis, it's all nothing. It's amazing that we've gone this far off the rails. And uh, truth is going to win out and it is winning out now, but it, it's an amazing time of hysteria right now. Yeah, it's interesting. Also the CO2, you, you said uh, the CO2 is uh, like the, the, the whole thing that CO2 is really essential is not true. Uh, and it's interesting because a lot, a lot of companies even have those CO2 uh, goals like zero CO2 when they produce the iPhones. I think Apple <laughs> announced something a year ago and then all those big companies that are like really, really, really big players, but they're like, yeah, like we have to get the CO2 level down. Um, what, what, by the way, first, like, let's go to basics. What is CO2 <laughs> uh, yeah. and, and why is it not so crucial? Well, yeah, it's carbon dioxide and it's arguably the most important uh, most important compound on earth because it's the basis of life. It's the basis of photosynthesis. And uh, if we don't have CO2 in the air, we all die. We have to have it there. And so the fight against CO2 is like fighting oxygen or it's like fighting water. It's just a critical part of our life, uh, of life on earth. So it's just amazing that uh, people think that it's, uh, it's a demon molecule that's causing all this terrible stuff and we have to fight it. Uh, I've talked elsewhere about there's an actual peer reviewed paper that says that one thing we should do to fight CO2 is have 2 million people working full time cutting down trees and digging holes and burying the trees in the holes to sequester carbon. Because as a tree grows, it sucks out CO2 from the air and uh, carbon goes into the trunk and to get rid of CO2, get rid of carbon rather, we should bury it underground or sequester it underground by cutting down all these trees. So it's just an example of just this crazy fight against this important molecule that we need. And another thing about CO2 is that there's not very much of it in the air. It's only 0.04% of the air right now is CO2. So humans supposedly have added one additional CO2 molecule to the air for every 10,000 molecules of the air. So the fact that we're just going crazy and uh, over this one extra molecule for every 10,000 molecules and thinking that uh, that should be the centerpiece of our government is to fight carbon dioxide, it's just beyond crazy. It's amazing. Is there any difference when we, uh, as a humans, we like uh, use... Like on a on a very human level, we we have like plastic things going on. Like, oh, you should not use that plastic. The plastic should be recycled nicely. Uh, or we should not drive normal cars. We should drive electric cars that are like a little bit bigger things. Uh, but then, oh yeah, the, the, those celebrities should not drive with a private chat. Like like there are like a lot of different levels on where we are like, oh, like we we have to we, we have to not do this because of of the the earth. Um, is it uh, even to a small extent, true that uh, we have to um, make sure our climate is uh, good or our Earth is good. Can we do anything to actually make our Earth better for humans, or is it anyways getting? Uh, is it anyways good, no matter what we are doing? Yeah, uh, I think Dave Collum talks about smuggling other arguments into the climate argument. So there are some, there are real pollutants and the humans, we affect the climate uh, in some way, not maybe we can't measure it, but everything on earth affects the climate in some way. But then uh, right away, people start talking about other pollutants, about uh, non-CO2 pollutants that uh, might cause the air to be dirty in a city or something. So yeah, there are real pollutants and mercury in our water. That's, that's a real pollutant. And so the whole idea that people like me, we think that humans have no effect on the earth and that all pollution is great and uh, let's just pave over everything. Uh, I mean, I'm a bird watcher and a deer hunter and I, I love nature myself. But uh, what I'm saying is the whole fight just against carbon dioxide, that part of it is crazy. But and I think that's taking some of the oxygen or the attention away from fights against real pollution and against uh, real conservation of natural land, et cetera. So I think it's important not to mix all these arguments together. And th the one that I'm talking about is the fight against CO2. That particular fight is totally crazy. That part of it. 
Interesting. What are the some of the the, the real pollutants that, that actually hurt our environment? Yeah, I don't know as much about those. Definitely, uh, like mercury is one of those, but there are other things. I, I'm not sure what to think about the various pesticides or even about the DDT. Um, I don't think it's as dangerous as uh, advertised sometimes, but yeah, there's a lot of pesticides. Uh, my dad is a farmer still, and uh, he tries to reduce the use of pesticides. I don't like the idea, even in my neighborhood here, of just uh, spraying with a helicopter or dropping uh, pellets to uh, try to get rid of mosquitoes and stuff. I don't think we fully have uh, researched all these chemicals to make sure they're long-term safe. I don't know the answers, but generally, uh, these unnatural pesticides, et cetera, I think we need to be very careful with them to make sure that uh, we're not causing more harm than good with them. Another thing that I was wondering about, uh, and I think you also wrote it in those uh, five, six points that you, uh, that you sent to me, um, it seems like whenever you uh, discuss that or you see a political debate around that, it's like, oh yeah, all ex experts uh, uh, agree like, yes, uh, we have to fight climate crisis. And then the other side is like, Yeah, yeah, but no, there are other experts also. Um, do most of the experts agree on that? Or like, uh, how, how is that looking? That's a great question, because the narrative is that 97% of scientists on Earth believe that there's a climate crisis caused by carbon dioxide. That's kind of the narrative. But yeah, the reality, I think, is quite different. I don't know what the answer is, but I think that most scientists on Earth believe that CO2 is a greenhouse gas and everything else being equal, that adding more CO2 will make the Earth uh, slightly warmer in some sense. I think there's some consensus on that, but even there's quite a few people that don't even go, go that far. But the whole idea that right now it's too hot and we're experiencing a climate crisis right now, uh, I think almost no scientist in the world is living as if he or she actually believes that. If you look at their lifestyles, they're just living like the rest of us. They're flying and driving their internal combustion car and all that stuff. So I think uh, this whole thing, I call it a, a cult, this whole climate cult. It, it's an odd cult that even the believers can't be bothered to behave as if they actually believe in it. it, it it's very odd. Uh, almost nobody actually behaves as if they really think that CO2 might kill our children because it's crazy and it's not going to harm our children at all. I think one popular example of that is always Bill Gates, where he buys land directly in front of seas. And then he like argues also that like sea levels are rising and stuff like that. Um, are sea levels <laughs> rising? Is there any anything anything to that? Yes, sea levels are rising. Uh, I just looked it up and I think either NOAA or NASA says that they think seas have risen eight or nine inches since 1880. So it's not, as, it's not as easy as you might think to get that number because it's hard to figure out what's going on. There's tides happening and the land is moving up and down. And uh, it, it's hard to tell exactly how much global seas have risen in that time. But I do think that's probably right that the seas have risen maybe eight or nine inches since 1880. But um, most people also agree that seas in the last 200 centuries have risen about 400 feet. So It's uh, varied a lot uh, how much it's risen per century, but that would be an average of two feet per century. And uh, so seas do rise. We are in, in an interglacial. And uh, 20,000 years ago, it, it was way colder. And that ice, a lot of it has melted over the last 20,000 years. And seas have risen, like I say, maybe 400 feet. So I think kind of, it's kind of weird that we're supposed to think we had about 400 feet of natural sea level rise. And then we should panic over this last eight or nine inches And we think we caused it and we should panic about it. So that sea level rise uh, since uh, 1880, it's nothing to panic about. And uh, we don't know how much of it humans caused, uh, but it certainly wasn't all of it. So I'm not worried about sea level rise at all. And in some places on Earth, the, uh, the, land, is the uh, land moving up and down is much more important than the global sea level changing. Wait, land moving up and down just because? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I think in Juneau, I need to look it up, but Juneau, Alaska might be an example of one place where the land is is moving up faster than the, the sea is rising. So there's a relative change there that's not what you might expect. Interesting, interesting. So so you're saying it's it's uh, like definitely no danger right now, uh, but can it ever be uh, a danger if there's too much water on Earth Then the whole Earth is underwater? Yeah, I... I I think we're just going to have to adapt. Whatever happens, we're going to have to adapt to it. And humans, I mean, we've been around. We've seen a lot of this change. Humans, of course, were around for this whole 400 feet in the last 20,000 years. 
humans were around for that. And of course, the land bridge between the between America and Russia uh, that uh, appeared and disappeared. And it's interesting that I'm reading that Roman ports that were in use in the Roman times, uh, some of them might be a mile or two inland right now. They're just way inland. There's no access to the sea there. So yeah, the, the seas are going to change definitely by uh, us eating cheeseburgers or not, or riding our bikes or not. We're supposed to think that that is going to uh, like stabilize the sea levels. But that's not how it works at all. We're just going to have to adapt. So, sometimes I feel like it's co could even be uh, correlated to money getting devalued because if you uh, convince everyone that they have to ride a bike instead of a car, then their cost of living is going down and then they don't uh, see inflation that heavily on, on their bills. <laughs> like, even that I, thought was in my head. I've heard safety and make that argument about uh, inflation and about food, I think, that they want to get us to eat the bugs instead of eating steaks, uh, partially because of the uh, value of our money is going down. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I do think that the, uh, the whole money printing thing is affecting everything, including the forever wars and the forever war against carbon dioxide. And it's, uh, it's important to think about that. Yeah, I had the um, offer of uh, Fiat Food, uh, Matthias Lusiak on, on my show. And he basically wrote a book about Fiat Food with Cypherdeen. Uh, and this was really interesting where we also got into like food supplies and what changed in the last hundred and, uh, years uh, and how they try to get like cheaper and cheaper food because people are really upset if, if their groceries are going up in price. Uh, so what is the uh, thing if like the, the money is getting devalued, they kind of have to adopt something and the food supply is kind of uh, changed. And he really gets in a lot of arguments in, in like how uh, school uh, foods have changed in the last 50 to 100 years and all those things. But yeah, it has nothing to do with climate. But I think there's an interesting comparison to be made that like even um, those arguments are maybe even used in, in the climate debate for lowering the cost of living. Uh, it's, it's interesting to think about. Yeah, I think you made me think about uh, there's something called shrinkflation, right? Where uh, they like remove one or two uh, Dorito chips from the bag of Dorito chips. So the, the cost may stay similar, but there's just a little bit less product in there. I think there might be quite a bit of that. Um, then the other thing is, I just, it makes me laugh kind of this whole idea that we need to have crickets in our bread. That's going to prevent bad weather in 2050 if we eat bread with crickets in it. That's an actual argument that we're hearing. And it's not the only ridiculous one. It's just like there's hundreds of these completely crazy arguments. It's, uh, it's yeah. funny. Yeah, true. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I definitely want no one good friend of mine, unfortunately, that I have to send this episode to. <laughs> I'm good. really looking forward to that. Um, uh, I, I talked to, to, talk to you about that before. We, we have already right now in Austria uh, a small flood going on. It's not a big one. It's not like uh, houses are washed away or something like that. It's just like, yeah, we, we experience a lot of rain. And yes, uh, the, the small rivers that usually have almost no water in them have now water, a lot of water in them. And some U-Bahn station and some cellars are over flooded. But nothing really crazy. Nothing that anyone would notice in like two, three weeks. So we would talk about that. Um, but what I've noticed is that all political parties shifted <laughs> into like, oh yeah, that, that's because of that. And there's like the other is like, oh, that's not because of that. So like, uh, especially the Green Party is like, oh yeah, we have to fight against cl climate. We have to ride with the bike to the work uh, because we experience a, like a, a massive flood. Um, what's your thoughts around that uh, situation that I just described? Yeah, so there is this overall, there's this idea that bad weather, you can just point at bad weather and say, ah, this proves that CO2 causes bad weather. But that that's never true. None of this. You can point at any fire or flood or drought and, oh, look how bad it is. We're, they're constantly saying it's, they're trying to tell us it's unprecedented. And uh, we haven't seen a flood like this for 10 years or 50 years or whatever. But But anyway, uh, it's very important to realize just how bad the floods and droughts and everything were in the past, even in human history. Uh, Tony Heller is a guy. He's um, at Tony Climate on X. He just does a great job of uh, digging into the past and just showing. We have all these records of just horrible things that have happened uh, that have been recorded in human history. And the whole idea that whatever just happened is uh, it's really bad. It must have been caused by CO2. Total non-starter. And one thing I like about the floods is that there are these 
churches in Europe, a church, for example, uh, I've seen several pictures of those where it shows uh, here's where the flood got to be in 1540 and here's where the flood was in uh, 1720 or whatever. I don't know if you've seen those pictures where they actually have the high water mark uh, on the church. And I think that's just a great counter to whatever flood just happened now that's like 10 feet uh, lower than that was the one in 1540 that we're supposed to panic about the current flood. So uh, there's another flood I wanted to mention here in California that people don't uh, know about maybe. Around 1862, during the U.S. Civil War, there was just an absolutely mind-blowing, like close to maybe 40 days and nights of rain in California. And uh, one quarter of the cattle drowned in California. And there was an inland lake that was, I forget, maybe 300 miles long and uh, tens of miles wide. Just a mind-blowing flood that happened way back then, way before we were burning much coal or whatever. And 100%, if a flood like that happened, that there would be so much publicity that we have to change our ways because CO2, look at this. Uh, it was such a bad flood that CO2, the humans must have caused it. Uh, but my point here is that if you look back, uh, there's just horrendous things that have happened. Whatever happened now is probably not anywhere near as bad as what happened in the past. And once in a while, we're going to get a really bad event that maybe it is a 500 year event now. But still, that doesn't prove that CO2 caused it. CO2 is not causing any of this stuff. Even the IPCC says that, by the way, if you carefully read what they say, like about floods, they say that we don't even know the sign of the global change in floods. And they say similar stuff about droughts and cyclones. And in fact, in cyclones, it looks like uh, globally, they might be just going down a little bit. They're going to fluctuate. But the whole idea that any current storms uh, are worse now and we should panic about that, totally not true. Also in U.S. hurricanes, there's a guy named Joe Bastardi that talks about U.S. hurricanes. For whatever reason, in the 1950s, the major hurricanes that hit the U.S., it was just a really bad decade. And we don't really know why. They fluctuate some decades. There's not many. And the 1950s were really bad. But again, this whole idea that if we put more CO2 in the air, we get more hurricanes, floods, droughts, not true. We're constantly told that the CO2 makes wet places wetter and dry places drier, but that's not happening either. The Sahara looks like it's getting wetter for some reason recently. We don't know why. For me, it's that um, the difference between normal weather and climate is, is kind of like the, the, the thing that I always get to when people are like, oh, it's, it's raining, it's because of that and, and stuff like that. Um, it's still like uh, from, from a science perspective, what is the difference between like weather and, and climate from those things? Because it seems like they, they're kind of getting mixed up some days. Yeah, I mean, one definition I see is that climate is a 30 years, a 30 year average of weather. You hear that someplace, that it's a 30 year thing. And so like for an individual storm to be, I would say for it to be a climate event, one storm, that storm has to last for 30 years. Otherwise, any other storm is it's just a weather event. We're, that's the thing, though, we're seeing in the media that they're constantly referring to a storm as a climate event. But uh, that's because they're trying to sell this narrative, I think, or this is in their head that uh, things that happen that the last for two days, they're, they're calling them climate events. But those are weather events. And I, I think they should get back to calling them appropriately weather because that's what it is. Mm, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, and for people that want to really get started with that rabbit hole, I think you even made a, a movie or you produced a movie. Um, it's called Climate the Movie. Uh, movie about climate, climate, the movie. It makes, it makes a lot of sense, the name. Um, why did you make that? What is your goal with it? And is that a, a good starter for, for entering the climate rabbit hole? Yeah, I'm glad, glad you brought that up. I was the producer of Climate, the movie, and it's a follow-up to Martin Durkin's 2007 movie, The Great Global Warming Swindle. That went on TV in Britain in 2007, and it got a huge blowback because of people's minds were kind of blown that this uh, thing on TV was pushing it back against this narrative. So the media went after him. He got a lot of uh, kind of a personal attacks. And then he was on my podcast uh, in October of 22, I think it was. He said, you know, given more time and what I know now, I, it would be nice to remake that movie. And that kicked off a process where I worked with him. It took about a year total. And I give Martin all the credit in the world for making this movie. He uh, did the interviews and he wrote the script and he did the narration. He did all uh, he did a lot of the editing. His team and him did a great job. And I think this movie is, does a very good job of just tearing apart this whole narrative that we've just been talking about, that the weather's getting worse, et cetera. It's uh, 80 minutes long and about the first two thirds is about the science. We have a lot of scientists, uh, prominent scientists in there, including a Nobel Prize winner, 
2022 physics Nobelist John Clauser calls this whole thing a crock. And we have uh, Will Happer calling it a, a scam or a hoax. And we have uh, Richard Lindzen, also a decorated scientist. Yeah, he's calling it a, a cult. So the movie has uh, done very well. Um, it's available for free kind of everywhere. It's a lot of copies are on YouTube and Rumble and BitChute and Substack and Telegram. A lot of copies are on X and it has uh, way over 10 million views. It's hard to keep track because there's uh, probably over 100 copies of it up right now and lots of clips of it are up. And so what makes me happy is a lot of people online have uh, downloaded either the whole movie or clips and then they've put that, that up separately on their own social media. So it's kind of viral, it's kind of gone everywhere. And Facebook and Instagram have uh, given people strikes for uh, sharing a link to it because it's supposed to be disinformation or misinformation. But that's a total crock, too, because the, the, it's, it's just information. It's not misinformation. But again, it's pushing back against the narrative. And uh, somebody behind Facebook doesn't like uh, the pushback against this whole climate scam narrative. Interesting. What is the what is the main takeaway from from the book? Was it kind of what we already discussed in the first 30 minutes? Yeah, yeah, it's mostly that that uh, the whole it's the whole thing is hysteria, and it uh, goes back and it points out that the weather was bad in the past and warm times were good and just a lot of the stuff that we've talked about already here. It just makes the point that uh, we should not be fighting CO two and and uh, why are we really doing this? Uh, maybe there's other motives for doing this. Uh, it's an attack. It's mostly a an attack actually on working people and, and free people. Yeah, I, I think people like uh, working class people are figuring out that uh, people who are trying to fight, uh, push uh, this climate scam narrative, they don't have the interests of the working people in mind. It, it's not helping out uh, people who have real jobs. It's just uh, sucking uh, their money and power and for no real reason. If you watch my podcast already for more than two times, you know how extremely passionate I am about self-custody. And the first very, very, very important step to self-custody is always getting yourself a hardware wallet and i have one for you here this is the bitcoin only edition from the bitbox my favorite single signature hardware wallet on the market another really important piece of self-custody if you have a hardware wallet is the backup of the seed phrase and bitbox made the perfect solution to back up your seed phrase they made a reusable steel wallet check out that beauty it's durable and extremely heavy if i put it on the desk i seriously fear for my own table it's so so heavy and durable i love it this is where my seed phrase is secure go to bitbox.swiss robin to get your bitbox and if you use code robin you even get five percent off of your complete order and the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual you you have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an perfect bitcoin watch that's the perfect subtle elegant way to go out there and show that you are a bitcoiner and that watch brand is bitcoin only and coin vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing genesis edition of their watch collections you have the date of the first ever mined bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in i love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions i love those watches so so much as you mentioned facebook uh what what role does uh, big tech with google facebook apple uh play play 
into that? What what role are they just reacting to the to the bigger narrative, or do they have uh, some role playing in that? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, we saw this. So many people are uh, now seeing what happened with the censorship in the whole COVID thing. There was all that censorship and working with the U.S. government, working directly with the U.S. government to do this censorship. So one guy who does a great job of talking about the whole censorship problem is Mike Benz, B-E-N-Z. I love listening to his content about this, but that's a huge problem. Uh, not, just, of course, just with climate censorship, but uh, all sorts of narratives that are being pushed on us. The truth is being censored by big tech, maybe working with governments and maybe working with the U.N. There's a famous... Uh, Melissa Fleming from the UN is talking about, uh, or saying we own the science, and she's proudly saying we're working with Google to suppress the uh, climate skeptic narrative on Google. She's just saying the quiet part out loud. So it's pretty amazing that they're admitting that they're they're censoring us, and they have to censor us because uh, in a free market of ideas, they lose every time we have a full uh, public, we have a real public debate on this. The alarmists lose because there's nothing that that backs this up. They they. There's been high profile debates where they've lost and now they're, they're not interested in doing debates anymore uh, publicly uh, because and I think that's an important point for people to realize if you're coming from outside the debate. I think the side that avoids debates uh, is probably not the side that's right. I think that's a general point, like the the the, the side that doesn't want to debate too much and, and wants to send the other side is probably hiding something. Otherwise, they would not be <laughs> fearful of a debate. That's a that's a great general point, I think. And again, in human history, people have said, when in human history have the people doing the censoring been the good guys? I don't know when that's ever been the case. Uh, yeah, true. Like censoring is a historical thing that is, has always been there in, in some sort. Like, of course, like now it's it's different with social media. And it's I think it's getting harder and harder to censor the, the more we get advanced with technology. Uh, because even though you might get censored on Facebook, there's Rumble, uh, there's Nostra even now uh, yes. that is completely uh, sensor free, at, at least as I know. Uh, but there are not a lot of people uh, on there till now. So like uh, it, it's getting harder and harder with the technology technology advancements and also with, with Bitcoin. And, and maybe you can get into uh, what was your take a little bit on that also. Um, now people also have are not dependent on a on a on a banking system they can just like take their own money in their own hands so i think we have a lot of uh, good factors into play that the truth comes out and, and as you said like the uh, that are there they will always be there and it's just a, a matter of time till uh, society notices them yeah, one other platform we didn't mention is just X. That uh, Elon Musk gets a lot of criticism still, and he there. I think he had a quote about uh, something about freedom of speech, but not freedom of reach. And there are still complaints that some uh, things are getting throttled on X. But overall, I would say I, I'm a big fan of the changes that happened when he took over. Uh, I was definitely throttled and banned and stuff way more often back before he got X than than now. So for me, X is the uh, best place to get your message out in terms of a big audience and uh, not too much uh, shadow banning, I think. Absolutely. And access, the, I always ask my guests in the end of the show where they, uh, where people can find them and ask them questions. And 95 or 96%, I did not uh, make an exact status just in my head now, but almost everyone says like, yeah, X, you can find me on X. Some refer to a website, some refer to a YouTube, but like 95, 96% people say like, yeah, find me on X. So like it's, it's, it's a great platform because it mixes. Yes, there's the mainstream media on there. People actually watch it and even mainstream media quotes from X. So like it's a, really a portal to the mainstream media but it's not censored as the other platform. So I think it's a it's a great mix between Nostra and Facebook. <laughs> like that's how I see it. So one other platform that I might be using more is Substack. I just, I started, I just posted one thing on Substack. I've been putting out uh, just like podcast summaries and stuff out there, but not really doing much posting. But I, I just put one post out there and I'm kind of used to the YouTube comment section where you probably can't post a link. And if you post the wrong thing, they'll delete it. And But on Substack, it looks like you can post a link and you can post actual stuff and no one's going to take it down. So that really attracts me. And maybe Substack is going to uh, grow, uh, get more and more users because of that. I think this free speech right now on Substack is really nice. 
Can you not uh, also host your own sub stack? Uh, like, I, I'm not 100% sure about that, but I think you can host your own sub stack on your own address, but uh, on your own URL, on your own domain. But I'm not 100% sure about that. I, I think that's true. I haven't done that, but I, I think that is true. And then, then it's like your domain. Of course, the domain provider <laughs> can censor you, but then you really have to do something. <laughs> <laughs> that this is someone off. I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you have to be in the big leagues for that. Um, yeah. Um, before we come to the to the, the end routine and come closer to the end, uh, I want to ha ask you about Bitcoin also. What What's your general take on Bitcoin and what do you think is the role of Bitcoin in our world? So, yeah, I would say I'm uh, pretty much orange-pilled at this point. And so I didn't think about Bitcoin uh, much at all until I was on uh, Marty Bent's podcast a couple years ago, maybe, and, and Safetyne's podcast. And that just got me thinking about it. And I started to dig in and I uh, listened to the Bitcoin standard. And I've listened to a lot of Bitcoin podcasts. I've listened to uh, quite a few of your podcasts, which, uh, by the way, totally loving them. And uh, yeah, I think I think it's real. And uh, I have high hopes for this whole idea that uh, maybe it can uh, continue to compete against the central banks. I'm more and more learning about the whole central bank thing and and how this whole printing of money is just such an evil thing for humanity. So this whole idea of free money that uh, you, the governments can't use for forever wars again, uh, it makes me really happy. I have uh, I have high hopes for it. And I'm a fan and I, I'm orange pilled. I'm going to go to a uh, Bitcoin uh, Amsterdam coming up and uh, super excited about that. Bitcoin Nashville was very fun. Really cool. I'm also in Amsterdam. By the way, for everyone that's listening with code Robin, you get some percentage off <laughs> if you, you want to miss it <laughs> us there. Um, but yeah, um, really cool. Uh, one question. Um, this this was my first question uh, in the, in this podcast where I asked you about the impact of the humans and uh, about uh, our monetary system on the climate. Uh, which has no zero to no impact. But what impact do you think has central banks and cheap money on those narratives around uh, climate crisis? Do you think that uh, on a sound money standard, we might have uh, better narratives around the, around the climate? That is a great question. I haven't thought about that much about how these narratives have been financed, but it kind of seems like it's all it's a monolithic thing up above with the UN and the WEF, et cetera, pushing a number of crazy narratives on us. Uh, and uh, I do think that uh, in a Bitcoin world that maybe uh, they'll have less power. I, don't, I can't really picture it in my head what happens to them uh, 20, 30 years from now uh, when the, we've got hyper Bitcoinization. Uh, I don't know, but it seems like... Uh, it seems like it might be a more honest world and uh, less funding for, for just crazy stuff. We have so much funding or so much money printed funding of crazy stuff on and on that uh, I think if we can cut that out, uh, the world's going to be a much better place. I'm interested if it gets rolled out in just certain countries, maybe El Salvador. I'm really interested to see what happens there, if they can be a model. And uh, if there's a lot of success there that uh, other countries or other uh other areas on Earth, uh, on Earth might follow along behind El Salvador. Maybe I don't know. Uh, yeah, if you, I don't know if you have been to El Salvador, but if you want to visit, uh, there is in November actually the Adopting Bitcoin conference. I, I will also be there. Oh, I would love <laughs> I, to go. I don't think I can make it. I would love to go and see what it's like there. You haven't uh, been I, yet, right? I haven't been there. No, like yeah. that's why I really want to go there. Uh, and I was like, let's let's do it this year because Great. I have this podcast now for almost a year, like nine, ten months or something like that. Uh, and so many people from El Salvador and people that moved to El Salvador said, like, oh, you at least have to visit. And I was like, ah, okay, okay, but it's it's far. Like it's a sixteen-hour flight, and it's it's like yeah, I have to go there and then. Yeah, let's let's do it on the conference. So I will be there for the conference uh, in in November for like a week. Uh, I will be meeting people there and and seeing what's what's it all about. I also like did not um, have ha followed any recommendations of the, uh, the of the Bitcoin conference there. I just was like, oh, I will be just a normal uh, tour. I will be just like some Airbnb where I meet someone actually outside of the Bitcoin bubble in El Salvador. Oh, nice. <laughs> I, I really want to get uh, um, speaking with people there that are not into Bitcoin because the Bitcoiners obviously will uh, 
praise El Salvador. I really want to get also some some maybe negative uh, voices from El Salvador, maybe against Nayib Bukele on there because it's it's interesting for me um, how positive it has been. And I'm always really cautious if it's too positive <laughs> in some direction. <laughs> but maybe uh, maybe it's just really good uh, in El Salvador. Let's see. Super interesting. You, you've had a really interesting last 10, 9, 10 months, huh? Yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So interesting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one question um, before I end, the, before we come to the end routine, is there anything to the climate discussion that I have missed? Anything that I should have asked, but I didn't ask? Actually, one question that comes up is uh, that why is it warming so fast recently? I, I, I hear that quite often that humans must be causing climate change because it's so fast, way faster than it ever did. But anyway, uh, that narrative, like everything else that's alarming about the narrative, is just a complete crock because it's not warming that fast. Since the uh, we had a little kind of a uh, global cooling scare in the 1970s, so I think Earth has maybe warmed by 0.18 C maybe per decade since then. Um, and, you know, it, it warms for decades and cools for decades. I don't think that we're necessarily going to see that. We can't project that rate into the future forever until the Earth boils or anything. But anyway, the whole idea that uh, we know that Earth's climate is supposed to be stable. And uh, there's this whole hockey stick thing. I don't know if you've heard much about the hockey stick where the Earth's temperature is supposed to be like the a handle of a hockey stick for maybe thousands of years. Earth's temperature was pegged flat. And then as soon as the Industrial Revolution happened, then it's like the blade of the hockey stick where suddenly, as soon as we started burning coal, that Earth's temperature shot up. So anyway, both parts of that hockey stick are just a complete crock. The whole handle of the hockey stick that temperatures were supposed to stay stable for thousands of years. That's not how it works. The Earth's climate just uh, on decadal scales, for sure, it goes up and down. So the whole straight pegged handle of the hockey stick, that's not a thing. The whole idea that it shot up when we started uh, burning fossil fuels, that's absolutely not a thing. I just saw in a, a graph, a kind of a climate scam propaganda graph that showed the Earth's temperature kind of falling between 1850 and 1910. So the whole idea, anyway, that Look, uh, it must be us because temperatures shot up when we started burning coal. They absolutely did not start uh, shooting up. So bottom line is uh, Earth is not warming uh, super fast and uh, we shouldn't expect the uh, Earth's temperature to just remain pegged. And if it changes, then it's our fault. That's kind of the narrative. It changed. Uh, that must be our fault. We should expect it to be stable. That's not the way it works at all. I feel like humans cannot handle that they are not in control. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fascinating to see that like, oh, we, we, we have to control it. And obviously uh, we can contr control a lot, but uh, not, not, not the climate. <laughs> it's so interesting. I hear this argument a lot that we have to stabilize sea levels because we built all this civilization based on the idea that the sea level is going to stay in the same spot. So we got to do whatever we can to make it stay in the same spot. But anyway, like I said earlier, humans have, we've been around a long time and we've seen enormous changes in the seas. And if we're around another 2000 years, we're probably going to see more changes in the seas. We don't know, but we're not going to be able to stabilize it, the, the climate or the CO2 level. We can't basically globally, we can't stabilize any of this stuff. We're going to have to just uh, roll with the punches as they come. It sounds like that uh, underlying all those narratives is just fear of the human beings of their own good. Like they're like, oh, like sea levels are rising, all those things. Like it's, it's just inner fear uh, that they have of like maybe something really bad happens to to humans. Yeah, I think there's a lot of things going on psychologically here. I think a lot of people, uh, their lives are so easy and uh, all of their needs are taken care of and they're kind of almost looking for a problem. And I think there's people that are living, they, they got all they want to eat and uh, whatever, food, clothing, shelter, it's all taken care of. But oh no, I've got this huge problem because I'm living through a climate crisis. And I, now I've got the problem that I need. I think, I don't know what percent of the people that applies to, but uh, some of them for sure. I have seen that a lot in uh, in friend groups where, uh, the, like, for example, I'm so busy making my podcast. I don't even have the time to uh, be like, oh, like the climate. <laughs> like, I don't even have the time to 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 to, to fear the climate. Uh, that's why I, I like to speak with people that know more about it because uh, maybe I have to fear about it. But it seems like with everyone. Uh, the, that has uh, to deal, dealt with the, the facts they, that they all tell me, oh, I don't have to fear about that at all, at all like you. Uh, but if, if you have a mission and if you are a driven person, 
uh, you're not so not not so susceptible to those narratives because you like you have a mission and you 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 really want to go somewhere and you're not like oh this I have to create a new problem here a new problem here so I think that is a big part of it actually like humans are trying to to figure out a new problem for themselves to keep them busy. Yeah, I should point out that I hate to admit it, but there was a time when I believed in this narrative that I kind of believed in whatever the TV told me. It was a long time ago, but I believed what the TV told me because I thought the experts had proven it. And it's been fact checked. And but I think recently in the last like even last three years, I think enormous amounts of people have figured out that the media is lying to us all the time about everything or almost everything. I have had tons of people come up to me and say that I believed in this climate thing until the COVID thing. And I figured out, uh, oh no, they're lying. So now I can't just trust the media or I can't just trust the alleged experts. And that's when I looked into climate. And that's all you have to do in this climate thing. If you're interested, you can look at the data for yourself on anything about, you can look at the polar bear populations or like crop yields. We're supposed to believe that CO2 is causing worse crop yields. It's super easy for you to just look at our world and data and see that crop yields are going up. And the, the whole idea that CO2 is making our crops fail, it's totally ridiculous. So I, I do think that trust in experts have has failed. And um, I, I've heard elsewhere that uh, the elites went for the great reset and what they got was a great awakening. And I think that is really happening. I'm loving it. Totally loving it. I, that, that's very true. Um, what made you wake up? Like what you said, like you believe those narratives were, was there a trigger event where like, oh, now I get it. Now I have to so ask more questions. I'm a bear, embarrassed even then because my awakening was was slow. I awakened to the climate thing back around 2006 or so. I have this whole backstory about this ivory billed woodpecker rediscovery that was announced around 2005. And as a bird watcher, I looked into that data. It was peer reviewed data and it was just a total crock. So I, uh, on my blog, I helped debunk that one thing. But then somebody emailed me and said, you know, you should look at the climate thing because it's the same deal, that the narrative does not match the data at all. So that's how I woke up on climate. But then for years, I was still believing what my doctor told me. And I still believe that breakfast was the most important meal of the day. And I believe that vaccinations had all been tested. There's all kinds of things that I believed for many years that uh, I still thought I could trust the experts. But now I feel like I have to... <laughs> have to kind of individually look at everything. I have to question everything because I don't know which narratives anymore are true. I don't know what I'm believing right now is, uh, is also false. I just have to look into everything. But I think it's healthy that people are looking into everything these days. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a healthy approach to be always critical. Uh, one, one big uh, thing that is always going on also, I, I feel like people have, have that uh, inner, in they have a driven thing where they want to have a stand on something. They want to have an opinion on everything. Uh, and sometimes I feel like it's just good to not have an opinion, like just to say like, oh, I'm not uh, researched enough on that. I'm not knowledgeable about something like that. This was at least for me always in the climate uh, when people ask me because it is a popular topic uh, in the world and people are like, oh, what, what do you think, Robin? I'm like, I did not do my research. Sorry, I have no opinion on, on climate. And, and people are shocked when I tell them this. Like people are like, what you have to have? Like the, <laughs> the polar bears. <laughs> and I'm like, no, like I did not do my research. Like I cannot have an opinion if, if I didn't do the research. And, and people are afraid to, to, to admit that. And there are a lot of uh, opinion, a lot of topics that I never looked into and that I have no clue about. And I will tell everyone that I have no clue about and I have to do research. Even with climate, uh, I didn't do a lot of research. Like I, I'm, I'm on my, my starting, starting, starting point, I will still say like, oh, sorry, I have no opinion. And I think that's, that's a healthy standpoint to say like, oh, I don't have an opinion on that. I have to do my research. Sorry, we cannot discuss <laughs> this. Yeah, I think that's super healthy. I think you're uh, light years ahead of where I was at your same age. So uh, yeah, I give you kudos for that. One example for me is like the Middle East. What is the answer? What, sh what should anybody do in the Middle East? I don't know. I, I don't understand it. So yeah, I think more often we need to say, I don't know. I don't understand it because we, we don't understand so many things. Absolutely. And if we uh, don't understand it, but still have an opinion, we're probably just uh, mirroring what we heard the most. And that's probably like the mainstream <laughs> narrative. And that's probably really, really dangerous. 
But yeah, um, let's come to the end routine of the podcast where I ask my guest uh, always the same question. Um, what can we learn from you besides all the things that we already talked about? I don't know if this counts, but just think for yourself. That is the number one thing that I like to say to everybody that uh, to my, you know, I have a couple kids in their 20s, but just think for yourself. I think that's always important. And uh, it's so much easier to not do the thinking. People, it's it's hard to think and it's so much easier to just take somebody else's word for it. But um, it, it's hard, but uh, thinking for yourself is the thing I'd leave you with. Uh, uh, fact check things and uh, just don't accept, uh, accept what you're told. That uh, always uh, try to do some sort of checking and some independent checking of what you're told. Now, the other end routine, as you might know, if you have uh, seen my podcast, is where the end routine of the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest is. Um, all my guests, assuming they, they are hyper-Bitcoinized uh, guests. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if this um, question is suiting for you or if you even have an answer to that, but I will still... Uh, just to keep up the end routine, uh, ask you the question, but you can take the question in whatever way you want to take it. Um, when would you think that an oil producing company would reveal that they are mining Bitcoin with their oil? Great question. When would that happen? It seems like it would be a long time. I don't know the answer to that. I'm trying to think which oil company. A BP just went out of the uh, onshore wind business. So they just announced that. I don't know what that means. Um, so they're getting less woke in that sense. I don't know. I, I guess I could see it happening in the next 10 years. I, I've heard other people say we have to wait generations for changes like this. But uh, I say I wouldn't be surprised in 10 years if it happens. We'll see. Don't know. Yeah, it's it's interesting how how fast things go. I would not have expected that two presidential candidates are on the Bitcoin conference and talking about a Bitcoin reserve, a strategic Bitcoin reserve in an election year. Like that was <laughs> that one in Nashville, uh, and you were there. That completely surprised me on a lot of levels uh, because when I came into Bitcoin in 2020. A lot of those things were not there at all. And 2020 was already really progressed uh, compared to like 2015 or 2012 or something like that. But that was that was miles away. Like we are already um, too far for me. Like we are already uh, too, too quick to, uh, from my understanding. I was not expecting Bitcoin to go as quick as, as, it, as it goes. But it's really interesting uh, for me to think. And one question that I have uh, with, with that, um, is it... Um, is it good, uh, or how should I ask that question? Um, what is the best way to fuel energy? Like there's wind, there's solar, there is uh, a nuclear energy, there are all those different um, sources. Um, what is, uh, from, from your perspective on the climate, the, the best source, or should we just use all of them, whichever is best for us? Uh, yeah, also a good question. I've looked into it a lot, and I am not at all a fan of wind or solar. I think they're almost all in the U.S. at least just about uh, subsidies rather than actually producing energy that's reliable. Because in both cases, you're dependent on the weather and the solar doesn't work at night and the wind doesn't work when the wind isn't blowing. So uh, Warren Buffett even said that his company invests enormous amounts or spends a lot on wind power. But he says we wouldn't even do it except for the uh, the tax breaks. So uh, there's a lot of misallocated capital in wind and solar. I'm from Minnesota and they're putting in tons of solar facilities that are going to just be buried in snow. And it makes no sense with the low sun angle. It's, it's crazy. They're covering over farmland and then they get destroyed if there's a hailstorm. There's tons of reasons not to use wind and solar. And I think we should just let the market, uh, if it really does make sense, uh, don't subsidize them. And if you want to put them up, if it makes sense, go for it. But the taxpayer should be out of that. But nuclear power. Uh, so far, I've had a lot of people on my podcast talk about that, and I am a fan. It's good baseload power. And I think it is the way we're going to power our civilization uh, years from now when we finally do run out of hydrocarbons. But yeah, some combination of hydrocarbons for transportation and nuclear power for electricity, I think those are uh, make a lot of sense. Absolutely. It's, it's like in Austria, everyone uh, that has a company uh, gets an electric car because they are subsidized crazy. <laughs> like you, 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 you get a lot of uh, incentives to get an electric car in Austria. Like there are no taxes to it. The, the, like you get really a lot of uh, incentives to get an electric car in, in Austria. 
uh, and when you look deep into, especially if you're a company, even as a private person, just with tax money, you get a lot of incentives. But if you're a company or your company does it with you, uh, there, uh, there are like massive financial incentives to get an electric car, which is which is crazy. The whole subsidize uh, conversation. Yeah. So there's just so so much misallocated capital. It just uh, kind of makes me sick. So much of this. And again, the whole idea is we have to drive electric cars because otherwise uh, the cyclones are going to be worse and we're going to get way worse droughts and uh, our crops are going to fail. All of that, is, uh, again, is just completely crazy. And uh, hopefully that'll, that'll go away because, of course, there's all this other mining that you need uh, to produce the batteries. And so uh, overall, the whole idea that if you drive your electric car, that uh, nature is going to be better or life is going to be better than if you drive a real car. Uh, Totally not true. Then there's this dynamic in California where they're trying to get rid of internal combustion cars. And um, at the same time, they're saying that please don't plug in your electric car because the grid can't handle it. So we got these two things. <laughs> We're going to go all electric and don't plug in your car. And some people say they want to get us in electric cars just because then they can uh, they can control our electric cars and control our mobility and sh <laughs> and shut off our ability to travel. I don't know. Uh, that might be part of the dynamic there too, but uh, none of it makes any sense. None of it. And it's interesting. Uh, I have driven a, a Tesla for, I think one and a half years. Uh, and I've not done it because of the climate. I was 100% because uh, <laughs> I like the car. It's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> to drive nice. around. Uh, and interestingly enough, a lot of people came up to me like, who oh, are you? Are you a climate fighter? Like, <laughs> I one of the sudden was associated with that, and I'm like, that that's bad. Like, that's bad. Elon has to fight the image for Tesla that it's that like if I buy, buy a Tesla that I'm not getting into the screen party things that I'm associated with. Then all of the sudden, I would love to know what percent of Tesla drivers are. Uh, that was a big part of their decision to buy a Tesla because they thought they were fixing the climate. I have no idea what that number is, but I'd like to know. I think it's probably high because um, Elon even himself, he even on the shareholder meetings and all those things, like he pushes that a lot, uh, electric cars uh, for the climate and the environment. But honestly, I, I, like they're, they're just fun. I think a lot of people just buy them because they are fun. They are, the, the autopilot is really good, uh, especially compared to all other systems, at least that, that I've seen. Uh, so like, uh, I think I would be interesting, you know, I have no clue. Uh, probably like, yeah. Would be interesting, but as, as I said, I have no clue about the statistics. Um, I at least for I my purchase was one hundred percent because of fun. Glad to hear I that. Don't, don't <laughs> I don't drive it now? At least, um, really cool, perfect. Then before I let you go, uh, question: Where can people find you? Ask your questions. Where can people uh, find your stuff? Yeah, the biggest place is just um, at Tom A Nelson at X. Uh, from there, you can look at my profile and I have a link tree that points you to climate, the movie, and my Substack and everything else. But yeah, X is where I do most of my stuff these days. Thank you so much, Tom, for being on. Uh, also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening to the podcast. Uh, as always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye bye. <laughs>